Amen. Um, let's pray. Pray after me. Avinu Malkinu. Our Father and our King, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to perceive, and the will to obey the word that I hear today in Yeshua's name. Today we're going to be continuing in our series, Thankful Living, and thus the um, PowerPoint. Um, I don't know about you, I, I watched it several times and it encouraged me because we do have a lot to give thanks for. Amen. And so far we've spoken about Thanksgiving as it relates to contentment. And last week Rabbi Carroll encouraged us to live lives of thankfulness. And this is not to be confused with the holiday of Thanksgiving, which is an opportunity for us to express our thankfulness before God, family, and friends. It is a lifestyle of thanksgiving, living a thankful life. And today's message is entitled, Thanksgiving Overflow, as it is God's desire for each of us to overflow with thanksgiving, because in a sense, thanksgiving is a litmus test of sorts that reveals our internal condition. Are we happy, content, do we feel blessed despite the earthly struggles that we each face? That's a valid question, right? That's a heart of thankfulness. Often we think thankfulness is when things are going well, but thankfulness is a condition of our heart. And so it's not uncommon to encounter people who appear, and I'm sure you have know some, that... Like they have it all together on the outside. Everything's well with them. They, they're financially sound. They, they look like they have the perfect family. Uh, and yet they are miserable on the inside. Because it is a spiritual um, condition to have a thankful heart. And we're going to discuss that this morning. With that in mind, consider this poem. Listen carefully. Today upon a bus... I saw a lovely maid with golden hair. I envied her, she seemed so gay, and how I wished I were so fair. When suddenly she rose to leave, I saw her hobble down the aisle. She had one foot and wore a crutch, but as she passed, a smile. Oh God, forgive me when I whine, I have two feet, the world is mine. And when I stopped to buy some sweets, the lad who served me had such charm. He seemed to radiate good cheer. His manner was so kind and warm. I said, it's nice to deal with you. Such a courtesy I seldom find. He turned and said, oh, thank you, sir. And then I saw that he was blind. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two eyes. The world is mine. Then walking down the street, I saw a child with eyes of blue. He stood and watched the others play. It seemed he knew not what to do. I stopped a moment, then I said, why don't you join the others, dear? He looked ahead without a word, and then I knew he could not hear. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. I have two ears. The world is mine. With feet to take me where I'd go, with eyes to see the sunsets glow, with ears to hear what I would know, I am blessed indeed, the world is mine. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. Um, thankfulness is the antithesis of that condition. And so another way to say that is God allow me and help me to live a life of thankfulness and overflow. So I want us to turn, if you're reading on your phones or books, or if you want to follow along on the PowerPoint, we're going to go to Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to look at the text um, a little bit this morning. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 6, and we're talking about how to overflow with thankfulness. How do you do it? Well, here are some things that Shaul tells us. In verse 6 it says, Therefore, as you received Messiah Yeshua as Lord, so continue to walk in Him. You should take notice in this text how many times the Shalachim uses that phrase in Him. 
that you so you continue to walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in your faith just as you were taught overflowing with thankfulness so a couple of things I see from these few verses is one that we need to receive Messiah Yeshua as Lord first off you hear me we need to receive Messiah Yeshua as Lord is first and foremost it is a personal decision that we make and that we live in the scripture says for if you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved to hear that you will be saved because we are in need of saving we are lost without God for with the heart it is believed for righteousness and with the mouth it is confessed for salvation for the scripture says whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all richly generous to all who call on him for everyone who calls upon the name of Adonai shall be saved is that good news See, all this is predicated on us repenting and turning from sin and turning to God, confessing our sins to him. We are a people who are in need of rescue. And unless we understand that truth, we think that we uh, are just adding something beneficial to our lives versus the mindset that we are drowning. We're drowning. And we need God to reach down and pull us up so we could breathe again. So my first exhortation to you is, have you received Messiah Yeshua as Lord? Personally. Made a decision. You know, I could stop and pray a prayer here, but you know what? It's not in a prayer. It's in a commitment that you make to follow him. Have you done that? Because here's the truth, if you have not done that, you are not saved. God saves us as we receive him as Lord. The second thing it tells us in these few short verses is to continue to walk in him. Continue. Say continue. continue. Remember a few weeks ago I talked about the Western idea of salvation is that we pray a prayer somewhere in some meeting that many of you likely did. And you prayed a prayer of faith, and that's it. Nothing else to do. You're saved by grace through faith, and nothing else required. That is the end-all, be-all of knowing Yeshua. And I want to tell you that that is not what the New Covenant teaches. The New Covenant teaches that that is the very, very beginning of a long, lifelong journey. It is the beginning. You were born anew, just like a new baby. When you have that new baby in your arms, mothers, wasn't that awesome? I mean, that's like, that's like the coolest thing ever. The baby comes out and is crying, and it's all ooey and gooey, and yet it's so awesome. But is that the end? That's the very beginning of a whole life of getting to see that child grow and develop and mature and learn and grow and become something great in God. Amen? The same is true for us spiritually. We are born anew, but God is looking for us to grow and to develop and to mature and to bear fruit in our lives and do something great for him. Matter of fact, that house that I say that we get in when we pray that prayer is a huge mansion that has many rooms that is filled with opportunities for us to grow in God. But so many just get in the door and just sit down and say, prayed the prayer, good to go. And they miss opportunities that God has. And that is what the Shaliach is saying here. To continue to walk in him in close relationship and connection to him there is a, a word that they use to describe the interaction between the triune God between the the uh, the Godhead and its perichoresis and what it is it's an interaction of one into the other interconnectedness and flowing in and out that they're 
individuals, yet they're one essence, totally connected. Connected to him. It's like discipleship. It's part of being discipled. Question for you. I, I like this question because we in the West, we don't have really a mind for it. But just a question for you to consider. Who's discipling you? For a lot of us, it's ourselves. We're discipling ourselves. The Internet's discipling us. The TV's discipling us. We're discipling ourselves. The scripture don't really paint that sort of picture of the body and the Messiah. It's a community thing. It's being in community in that someone grows and continues to walk in God. In Yochanan 15, Yeshua said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who abides in me and I in him, that perichoresis, that interconnectedness, that flowing in and out, just like the sap goes from the, right, from the root into the branch, and there is a give and take. The one who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Say nothing. Apart from me, detached from me, unconnected from me. You can do nothing. And so we need to continue to walk in him. Amen? To be connected to him. To stay close to him. To abide in him. In a close relationship. Then it says, it says, be built up in him. So it tells us how to overflow with thankfulness. One is to receive Messiah Yeshua as Lord. If you don't receive the Messiah... You are not going to overflow with thankfulness, number one. How to overflow with thankfulness, number two, continue to walk with him if you're a believer in Yeshua. Don't get in the, in the house of God and stop and say you've done enough. No, continue to walk with him. Continue to grow. Continue to learn. That's what a disciple is. It's a learner, a lifelong learner of the Messiah. Continue. How do we overflow with thankfulness? We are built up in him. How? Through prayer, through the reading of the word, through community fellowship. That's how we are built up in God. In Yehuda, otherwise known as Jude, chapter, chapter, there's only one chapter, but verse 20, it says, But you, loved ones, continue building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Ruach HaKodesh. Keep yourselves, keep yourselves in the love of God, eagerly waiting for the mercy of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah that leads to eternal life. So how do we live or overflow with thankfulness? We first make sure that we have received Messiah, Yeshua as Lord. We continue to walk in Him. So we're not 40 years in the Lord and yet we're two or three weeks old in the Lord because we prayed a prayer one time somewhere. Then thirdly, we are built up with him through those disciplines that God gives us in the word of God. Remember we did that series on spiritual disciplines. Every one of those disciplines is designed to build us up in God. I can't tell you how many weak believers there are that struggle over everything. I, I've been... Um, sharing this lately because as I've been reading a lot about the first four centuries of the body of Messiah I'll tell you if you read it it's an eye-opening experience because one thing you notice what a different perspective on serving God did they have than we have because right now in our current paradigm this is what we think that God must bless us we expect that there has to be there's something wrong if I'm not blessed of God. If I don't have all the things I want, if all my desires aren't fulfilled, there must be something wrong. Because isn't that what happens when you serve God? Realize in the first four centuries, they didn't expect to be blessed. They expected to be persecuted. Just like the Messiah was persecuted. They expected to be hated because the Messiah was hated. They were expecting that there was a good likelihood that they might be killed. 
because the Messiah was killed, because their master was killed. So could you imagine the different mindset that they, and the approach they had to faith? They didn't walk into their service and saying, oh man, I'm just not blessed. I don't, I don't have that donkey I wanted and I don't have all the bread I want to eat and man, my crops didn't give me the, the yield that I wanted this year. No, that wasn't even on their radar. They were just grateful that they knew the Messiah of Israel. That's it. Nothing added to it, nothing more, nothing less. Just that God revealed that truth to them. That was enough. It's a far cry from what you hear today, isn't it? You see, this leads us to a heart that's overflowing with joy and thanksgiving. We wonder, how were those folks happy and joyful? Because there was only one thing. Say one thing. One thing that everyone in this room who wants to can have. One thing. Yeshua. Nothing more, nothing less. One thing. You know, in reality, that's the only thing God really promised us. Right? That he would give us salvation through the Mashiach. We sang it today. Emmanuel. God with us. He would come and be with us. Is that not enough? I mean, think about it. Is that not the God of everything we see and don't see is with us? Is that not enough for us? That's all he really promises. You get to have me with you. That's how, see, now if we start at that place, we're already overflowing with thankfulness, right? Because we've either accepted the Messiah, Yeshua, or we can accept him. If you haven't accepted him, you could receive him today, right now, in your heart by a decision that you make. So with that said, we're already at the starting place that God wants us, a heart overflowing with thankfulness because of Him, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Hmm. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Say thanksgiving. Let your request be known, made known to God. Overflowing with thanksgiving. So how to overflow with thankfulness is those four things, those three things. To receive the Messiah, Yeshua. To continue to walk in Him. To be built up with Him, in Him. Right? That's, that's where it comes from. That's how. Second thing is don't be deceived. Don't be deceived and let, hear me, hear me. Don't be deceived and let a thankful heart be stolen away from you. Let me explain. Verse 8 says this. See, now he just, look what he just said to them. He gave, he gave them the how to overflow with thankfulness. Now he says, see that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men and the basic principles of the world rather than Messiah. He said, make sure and see that no one takes you captive or deceives you in that area. Don't be deceived into thinking that a life that produces a thankful heart comes through worldly pursuits or material things. Let me say that again. Because our Society is under deception. Don't think or be deceived into thinking that a life that produces a thankful heart, that's a contented heart, that's a saved heart, that's a heart that's filled with the joy of God, comes through worldly pursuits or material things. Now listen to me, that doesn't mean worldly things can't be fun. 
Now, if all you want out of life is fun, well, you can, you can buy fun, right? There's a lot of fun things I like to do. You know, right? It's fun to go on vacation, right? It's fun to do fun things. It's fun to take kids in a place where they enjoy themselves. That's fun. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an internal state of being that is filled with joy and thankfulness in your kishkas. That doesn't go away if things get hard, if life gets difficult, if challenges present themselves to you. No, it doesn't go away because it's in you. And Shaul is telling us here, don't be deceived into thinking how the world thinks. And he says, he talks about philosophy and empty deception. What is philosophy? Philosophy is human understanding or wisdom in contrast with divinely revealed knowledge. Human understanding or human wisdom, philosophy could be rendered in some languages as the way in which people are wise or the way in which people understand things, or the manner in which people reason, that will either take place through divine wisdom, as revealed in Messiah, or through worldly wisdom. So your philosophy of life is either worldly, or it's godly. It's either based on the principles, and as Shaul says, the deceptions of the world, or it's based on divine revelation that God gave you and me in Yeshua. Friend, there was no one more deceived than me. I was doing everything the world told me to do to have a good life. I got a good job. I was buying all the toys and the goodies. I was doing all the running around and you know all the night spots and all the stuff that the world said leads to a good life. But in my heart of hearts, it wasn't good. Because I was following worldly wisdom and worldly deception. So, each of us in this room are following one or the other. Sometimes, you get folks that try to do both. Those are the folks that are a little confused because, you know, we got so close. Remember, we just went through and we read about Lot in the Parsha. Remember Lot? You go right, so I'll go, Abraham went left. And Lot is about in the plains, pretty close to Sodom. The next scene, Lot is in Sodom. He got a little too close to the fire. And we know how that works out. He loses his wife, family, not good. <clears throat> trying to live in both worlds. Trying to live by worldly ways and philosophies and by godly ways. He can't. You got to pick. Empty deception. The word deception means to cause someone to have, hear this, to have misleading or erroneous views concerning the truth that would keep us away from the truth. The enemy is a liar. Amen? The enemy is a liar, and when he speaks, he speaks his native language. That's what Yeshua said about the enemy. He lies. So what does the enemy do? The enemy lies, he misleads, he deceives. That's what he does. Everything that he does is about lying, misleading, and deceiving the world. So think about that in a second. So, this is what the philosophy of men does. It deceives people into thinking, for instance, that Thanksgiving is about turkeys. Don't you think it's about Tom the turkey? It deceives people into thinking that Hanukkah is about gifts. It deceives people, Christian people, into thinking that Christmas is about trees and tinsel. 
when you and I know that those things are meant to be about God, aren't they? So we have, we have two paradigms. We have one that's divinely, divine wisdom, and one's deception. So as you sit around the table in a few weeks staring at a turkey and are tempted to compare your life to those sitting next to you, and do not, do not be deceived, says the Shaul, into thinking that your life and happiness and your ability to be thankful is based on the abundance of things you possess or the house you live in, or the amount of money in your bank account. Don't be deceived into thinking that. That is the temptation. To base our happiness on that is how human wisdom works, and is based on the principles of the world and the tradition of men, not on Messiah. Secondly, he tells us, is the tradition of men and the principles of the world. He warns us against that. So he warns us about the philosophy of men and about empty deception, and he warns us about the tradition of men and the principles of the world. Tradition meaning the um, traditional teaching or instruction of worldly principles, not God's eternal principles. Why is it this is a question posed to Yeshua. Why is it that your Talmudim obey the tradition of our ancestors? And at this, Yeshua quotes Yeshiyahu Hanavi. And he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines, as truth, the commandments of men. Not the commandments of God, the commandments of men. Made up commandments. Made up things that people tell you you need and have to have and must do. Not the word of God, but the commandments of men. Think of it. The principles of the world are the ways that the world does business. The basic foundational truths of the world apart from God are deceptive. They are riddled with sinfulness, lying, cheating, stealing, fighting, maiming, infidelity, and the like. And Shaul says something, he encourages the Kehila in Galatians chapter 4 by saying this. So also when we were children, talking about in the faith, when we were children, Hear this, we were subservient to the basic principles of the world. Shaul's argument is now we are grown up in Messiah and we now are only subservient to God. You don't have to be subservient to the world and to the way the world does things. See, the world wants to tell you what to think, what to wear, how to raise your kids, the types of lifestyles that are acceptable. And on and on it goes. The world wants to tell you what means success and what means failure. However, we are grown up in Messiah and now only subservient to God. And God tells us what a successful life is. A successful life is a simple life. You don't need a lot to be successful in God. To know him, to serve him, to love him. Period. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek the kingdom of God and two things. Love God, love your neighbor. Two things. That's it. Success. Let's look at number three. So we're talking about how to overflow with thankfulness. Then we're talking about the warnings not to be deceived because the world, listen, I don't know about you, I don't have my phone on me. Do you need another phone for a grant? Do you need another one? Because they tell you, you need the iPhone 11. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, and I'm going to show you why. I'm going to tell you why you need. iPhone 11 is only $1,000. <laughs> you have it, I'm sure. And yeah, and if you don't have the cash, 
<laughs> a fun front, just 20 bucks a month. And you could have the phone. It's just like this phone. When you flip it around, it's got three. Three of those. This only has one. That one has three. And you could have that for $1,000. And not only can you have it, you need it. You need it. Yeah. You need it. And we're going to make sure we get it in your hands somehow, somewhere. And that's only one example. The list goes on and on and on. And how many, I don't want to say, how many of us have a scrip subscriptions? 30 a month here, 15 a month here. You got next to the DD. Hundreds of dollars and $30 here, 15 there, 20 here. Right? You need every, because you need it. Because after all, if you go to the movies, it's going to cost you 10 bucks a head. But if you could load up your TV for $150 to $200 a month, you're going to save a ton. <laughs> but no, what happens is after, after you get the TV package, you go to the movies anyway. Because they tell you, you can't wait because the movie's so good. It's not going to come out on Netflix for another six months. Get out to the movies. And after all, the movies is a different experience. You get the popcorn and the soda. And uh, yeah, right. I remember when my kids were younger, going to, went to a, a few baseball games. You got to like second mortgage the house to go to a baseball game. By the time you park and tickets and then, you know, because the kids aren't interested in the game. They want the popcorn, the peanuts, the Cracker Jacks, the hat, the little thing from the store. You know, it's $300 to go to the baseball game. Because you have to go. If you're a good parent, you're going to take your kid to the baseball game. Hey, hey, what do you think? You're going to take your kid outside in the backyard and for free teach him how to play ball? Why would you do that when you could take them to a baseball game to see the professionals do it? You see that? We are deceived by the ways of the world, the traditions of men. That was just a little, I don't know where I went. I'm coming back to the path. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Point number three, why should... Why we should be thankful. Why should you be thankful? Verse 9 of our text says, here's why. We told you how. Receive Messiah. Be built up in Messiah. Walk in Messiah. Continue to grow. We, there's a warning there. Don't be deceived into thinking that you don't need to do that, that you don't need him, that the world is going to supply everything you need. Don't be deceived. Fight that. Resist that. And then we're told why we should be thankful. Verse 9, for all the fullness of deity lives in bodily, bo lives bodily in him, or in bodily form, depending on your translation. And in him, there's that word again, that phrase, in him you have been filled to fullness. He is the head over every ruler and authority. In him... You were also circumcised with a circumcision not by hand in the stripping away of the body of the flesh through the circumcision of Messiah. You were buried along with him in immersion through which you also were raised with him by trusting in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision sorry, of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When he pardoned us all of our transgressions. Wait, can someone say Baruch Hashem? All of our transgressions. My little Rolodex is going. All of my transgressions? He pardoned us all of our transgressions. He wiped out the head written record of debts with the decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He took it away by nailing it to the tree. And after disarming the principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the stake. So what do we see here? Why we should be thankful is one Yeshua Humelech. Say that. Yeshua Humelech. Okay, you Hebrew speakers. Yeshua Humelech. Yeshua is king. That's what that first line says. 
For all the fullness of deity lives bodily in him. He's God and he's in charge. You hear that? The world wants you to think that it's in charge. But God is telling you, no, no, no. Yeshua, he's God and he's the boss. <laughs> he's the boss. He's in charge of everything. Man, do I love that. Therefore, Philippians 2, God has highly exalted him and give him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord to the glory of God. Yeshua Humelech. Why should we be thankful? Because Yeshua is king. Second thing, we should be thankful because you were circumcised. Look at that little list. You were circumcised. That means you have now power over your flesh. You were circumcised. That's right. Why is that important, Rabbi? What's the power of circumcised? You have power over your flesh because before you sinned, as a part of your nature. You couldn't resist sinning. That's what you did. You woke up in the morning and you sinned. You sinned with your thoughts. You sinned in your actions. You sinned with your words, imaginations. You sinned. You really couldn't help but sinning because you had no power to resist sinning. But in Messiah, he circumcised us and he removed the control our flesh has over us. And we don't have to sin any longer. We're not in bondage to it. So we've been circumcised. We're dead. Is that a good thing? Yeah, it is a good thing. It is a good thing. Because when you're dead to yourself and your ambitions and your desire, all those things. You know, no one's so cool about Yeshua. The enemy comes to him. Remember this? He tempts him with everything. <laughs> He's going to show him all the kingdoms of the world. Take him to the pinnacle of the temple. Hey, you sure you can have anything you want? See anything that, that uh, you know, tickles your fancy? It's yours. Just worship me, right? But Yeshua was dead. Tell me with what? You have to come to the place where you've died with Messiah. What can the world offer you that God hasn't already given you? What? What can the world offer you that God hasn't already given you? And I'm sure you can come up with a few things. <laughs> I'm sure you can come up with a few things. But you have to think, think that through. Are those things really worth it? I don't know about you. How many commercials have you seen? Have you ever bought anything based on a commercial? I've bought tons, tons of stuff. Carol, we have to get this. It says that if we buy this, it'll do this. I don't know if you remember that thing. Remember that thing that has a little zzz, it cleans the tithe, you, you grout? They add it on the commercial. It spins, it's a little battery out, zzz, spinning thing. Carol, we need that so we could clean the grout. It'd be so easy. Then we get, oh my gosh, it's more labor to use that thing than it is to get on your hands and knees and clean and grout yourself. But I was so convinced we need that. And so the enemy convinces us we need stuff, things, people. Because it's going to make us happy. And then we juxtapose that to Yeshua. Because what's Yeshua really offering? He's just offering himself. <laughs> right? 
Yeshua is just offering him. So, but <laughs> Yeshua, I can have that. This, this little shiny thing and that shiny thing and that shiny thing and that shiny thing and God's offering me Yeshua? All I would say is this. Think it through. Think it through. Maybe God really does have you back. Maybe God really does know better than us. Maybe God is trying to show us that, you know, there's a turn, that all that glitters isn't really gold. That what the world says you have to have and what's going to make you happy, maybe it really doesn't make you happy. Just a thought. We're buried, but we're resurrected. We're forgiven and we're dead to sin. All these things happen as we abide in him, friend. The picture is simple. It's a branch connected to a vine. Cut the vine off the branch. Does it live? Does it produce fruit? Is it happy? Is it happy or disconnected? No. It's dead. Separated, useless, dried up, unfruitful, unproductive, detached from the vine. You see, all these things happen. We should be thankful because God did them for us. He circumcised us. We're buried with him. We're resurrected with him. We're forgiven in, with, forgiven in him. We're dead to sin in him. We have been buried or we died to our old way of life that conformed to the deception of the world's philosophy. We were raised to life and are now filled with the life of God through the Ruach. We have been forgiven, declared not guilty. Say, I am not guilty. You know, that's true. You're, you're not guilty. Doesn't matter what the enemy tells you, because the enemy wants you to think you're guilty because you blew it on the way here today. The scripture says you're not guilty because of what Yeshua did. If you're in him, you're not guilty. We stand innocent before a holy God, and that's something I want to tell you. Because we don't even know what holiness is. But the Shaliach Yochanan, remember, he walked with Yeshua for three and a half years. And in the apocalypse, he has a vision of Yeshua. Hey, this is going to be sweet. Nice little reunion. <laughs> I spent years with him. It's going to be cool. Kumbaya moment. Get to see him again. My buddy. What did he do? When he saw the risen Holy God. He felt like a dead man. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, God is holy. And it's something that we could stand in the presence of a holy God. Don't think that's a small thing. That's what Yeshua has done for us. That's why we should be thankful. And something else... And I said it before, and I want you to, this is a, a verse worthy of memorization. Sin shall not be a master. God has broken the mastery of sin over our lives. Doesn't mean we can sin. Of course, we can sin. We could choose to sin. But God has broken the control that sin had over our lives, that it has no longer mastery over us. In Yeshua's name. Amen. And then it says, He disarmed principalities and powers. And I want to tell you, we have no clue as to what that even means. 
We think we know what it means. Oh yeah, I know Ephesians 6, principalities, powers, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Yeah, I know what that means. No, you don't know what that means. One day you will know. One day our eyes will be opened and we will see these demonic entities that have been, they're ancient. They're as old as the world that control peoples and countries, nations, philosophies, that are strongholds. That's why, you know, do you know why God says to love people? Because why was Yeshua able to say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do? Because he knew firsthand, they're not doing this on their own volition. They are being controlled and deceived by cosmic beings that control the air. Oh, Rabbi, come on, you're really, I mean, that's, that's like, that sounds like sci-fi. Well, it, it's really the Bible. And I'll show you in a second. For those who are found in Yeshua, connected and abiding in God, for those who have accepted what God has accomplished in Messiah, are no longer under the control of cosmic powers that impose their will and agenda on humankind. Just like through Moshe we came out of Mitzrayim and were no longer oppressed by the Pharaoh. Now in Yeshua we are freed from spiritual oppression and free from the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, look what it says. It says, and you, thank God, Baruch Hashem, this is why, should we be thankful? Absolutely. And you, amen, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. According to the prince of the power of the air, we were duped, we were influenced, we were manipulated by the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves. We used to be in bondage to that. In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and in the, of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just like the others. The world is under the sway of the prince of the power of the air. How do you get out from under that? cosmic power, that demonic influence in Yeshua. Why? Oh my goodness. One day when we get to, you know, to, to heaven, or if heaven comes down to earth, whatever your eschatology is, and I really don't care, when, when, we, when it's all wrapped up in the end time, I know you folks who don't like to dance now, you're really conservative. You worship like this, oh, praise the Lord. You know, you know the ones who, you're, it's radical if you went like this. You're dying inside to do that. Because <laughs> it's, just, it's just not you. When you get into heaven, those feetsies, those tootsies are going to start going <laughs> like crazy. Because you are going to be so filled and overflowed with what God has done for you, what he's rescued you from. These demonic forces, these evil things that were binding humankind, you're free. And those men, those, you're going to be cutting a rug. <laughs> like no, nobody's business. I want to close with this. Man, we could stop here. We, we got a lot to be thankful for. Amen. Wait, you know what this is like? Maybe I'm in it right now. Tell me. Hold on. <laughs> Pinch me. It's like the Matrix. You know. He thought <laughs> it was real. He thought this was real. But until one day, right, got a little wake-up call, they pulled the thing out of his head, and they said, hey, that wasn't really real. This is real.
Everyone thinks that this is it. Everything you're looking at, we invest everything. The world system, the devil gets everything out of you. Put your heart, sweat, tears, everything into this, buddy. Because this 70, 80 years that you got here, that's all there is. Live it to the full. Go for the gusto. Right? That's the world's motto. But it's funny. Yeshua says something else. He says, don't go for that. Go for me. Don't go for that. Why? Because it's not real. It's not real. Or it's at least not the ultimate reality. So here's a little something I found. Walking through a park, I passed a massive oak tree, and a vine had grown up along its trunk. And we've all seen this because I have one in my backyard. The vine started small, nothing to bother about, but over the years the vine had gotten taller and taller, and by the time I passed, the entire lower half of the tree was covered by the vine's creepers. You ever see that? And maybe you have some in your backwoods. The mass of tiny feelers was so thick that the tree looked as though it had innumerable bird's nests in the tree. It was just overtaken by the vines. Now the tree was in danger. The huge solid oak was quite literally being taken over. The life was being squeezed from it, but the gardeners in the park picked it up. They saw the danger, and they had taken a saw, and they severed the trunk of the vine. That's all they did. They severed it, and even though the tangled mass of the vine's branches still clung to the oak, the vine was now dead. And that would gradually become plain as the weeks passed and the creepers began to die and fall away from the tree. It was free. How easy it is for the deceptions of the world which begin so small and are seemingly insignificant. And they grow until they have a strangling grip on our lives. Little by little. I know this story because I've seen it many times. Someone comes to faith in Yeshua, boom, wow. It's like a starburst moment, you know, boom, it's amazing. But then little by little, the enemy chips away one little creeper, two little creepers. Little things creep in and begin to strangle the life of God away. And yet Messiah's death has cut the power of sin and deception. Amen? Yes, the creepers of sin and deception still cling and try to affect us. But its power is severed by Messiah. And gradually the grip of sin and deception dries up and falls away as we remain in him. That's the truth. That's what I want to encourage you today. You know, we talked about how in the world can we really have a heart in this world that's overflowing with thankfulness. This is the only way I know of. My other option, I'm, I'm thinking about me right now, so pardon me. My other option is I could fake it, like everyone else. How are you doing? Fantastic. <laughs> doing so good, life's awesome. How are you? Great. Super. <coughs> A lot of us fake it. And you can. But that's not the way that God wants for you. That's not his best. He wants you to have it. Deep in your heart, real thankfulness and joy and it can be had 
in him. The only thing God, I'm going to promise you something, one thing. The only thing God is going to give you is himself. And you decide and I decide, we decide whether that's enough. I'm telling you it is. The word, the shaliach, Shaul is telling us it is. He experienced it. I've experienced it. You've experienced it. You just got to take him up on his offer. What do you think? It's going to do it your way, the world's way, or God's way. I highly recommend that we do it God's way. He's been around a little longer than us. Knows a few more things. He loves us. Anyone else die for you lately? Anyone else get tortured for you lately? Yeah. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father and our King. God, we are truly thankful. Lord, we can see, Lord, the wondrous things that you've done for us. Lord, the things that you've broken off our lives, the deceptions you've revealed, the joy you have to offer in the true life and peace and the life of heaven, God, that is before us. Father, I pray, God, for every person in this room, Lord, each one, no matter what they're going through, no matter what situation they're facing, no matter what choices they've made in the past, Abba, that they would make right choices today. Abba, that today they would choose, God, to serve you, to follow you, to abide in you, to remain in you, to be built up in you. Abba, that they would be, Lord, uh, on their guard against the deceptions of worldly philosophies and the traditions of men. God, I pray that they would know exactly why we should be thankful for all the benefits that you've done for us in the Messiah. Father, I pray that you would make that revelation real to every single heart. Father, that we wouldn't just be about, Lord, hearing a word, but we would be about the reality of your kingdom. God, that we would be those who make the most out of our life, Lord, filled with joy no matter what circumstances life throws our way, God, that we would have the true joy and thanksgiving of the living God, Lord, abiding with us. So, Father, I speak that over each one. I pray that your supernatural grace, Lord, your provenient grace, God, would be upon each one to help them, Lord God. And we ask it, Peshem Yeshua Mishikainu. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Um, let's stand. Okay.